All right. Hello, my name is Cameron Hurt. I'm an organizer with the Party for Socialism and Liberation, and I also help coordinate volunteer engagement for the Claudia Carina 2024 presidential campaign. We have here Dr. Cornell West, Claudia de la Cruz, and Dr. Melina Abdullah to discuss the recently announced agreement between both campaigns to cooperate in a number of states. The Claudia Carina campaign is calling on its supporters to vote for West and Abdullah in Alaska. In turn, West and Abdullah are calling on supporters to vote for Claudia and Carina in Florida, Hawaii, New Mexico, Mississippi, and Tennessee. Now, this may sound like a surprise to many, but it really shouldn't be because all of these candidates have a history of working together on many fronts of struggle. Both the West Abdullah and Claudia Karina campaign are united by shared values like ending genocide and war, a deep commitment to black liberation, and the determination to build an alternative outside the corporate two-party system. So it comes as no surprise that both progressive third-party campaigns urge their supporters to vote for each other's tickets in states where one has ballot status, but the other does not. Because of undemocratic obstacles that third-party candidates are subjected to, that Democrats and Republicans are not, both campaigns have had to carry out massive petition gathering efforts and then defend their ballot status in extensive and massively expensive court battles amid challenges brought by Democratic Party-affiliated lawyers. This agreement aims to maximize the ability of voters to send a clear message that they reject the twin parties of war, racism, and Wall Street. And it's in this context that I want to open up the floor to the candidates of both campaigns. In the context of the attacks against third parties and what we're up against as working class people in the current moment, I'd like to turn to the candidates, Dr. Cornell West, Claudia De La Cruz, and Dr. Melina Abdullah, Dr. West and Dr. Abdullah are the presidential and vice presidential candidates of the Justice for All Party, a party that seeks to directly confront the suppression of voter choice and help secure ballot access to promote people-powered initiatives. Welcome to Dr. West and Dr. Abdullah. Indeed, we are so blessed to be here. And we salute you, our dear brother, that uh, you were such a force for good in so many different levels in the Party for Socialism and Liberation, of course. We salute our dear sister Claudia de la Cruz, who's one of the grand freedom fighters and love warriors, not just of her generation, but connected people's form that brings people from all different colors and genders and sexual orientations together to fight against capitalism and imperialism, be it genocide and gobs or manifest with US imperial policies, or be it mass incarceration manifest at home. Uh, I'm not going to say too much. I just want to say that it's a beautiful thing to be able to come together. It really is. And I'm very excited about the announcement. It was about a month and a half ago, my dear brother Daruba and brother Kalanji has said, look, we had to have a united front after the election to make sure party, pre-party formations, institutions, infrastructures, and groups can come together. And I, I had not thought about ways in which a coming together could take place before the election. And then when I heard, when I heard from Sister Melina, who really conveyed the idea to me, I said, oh my God, that is just magnificent. My, my, my only uh, 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 challenge was always, I, I always hope and pray that we put the struggles against capitalism and imperialism connected to the struggle against white supremacy. When I talked about, when I saw that war against black people, it comes directly in some ways out of Malcolm's last speech that he gave in Rochester in February of 1965. I said, yes, that meets my criteria. And I don't think people had to meet my criteria because a lot of good people and a whole lot of different parties and formations and so forth. But I come out of the black freedom struggle and so I'm, I'm uncompromising in terms of the centrality of the struggle against white supremacy. And, 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 and the Party for Socialism and Liberation has always met that criteria, and we tried to do that in justice for all. And therefore, I'm very excited about this, and I want to be able to do all that I can to make sure that we encourage our folk to support, support the Party for Socialism and Liberation in those states where we're not represented, of course, is vice versa. But keep in mind, this is not a quid pro quo. This is not transactional. This is transformational. This is based on principle. And it has all the integrity in the world in terms of making sure that when we talk about freedom and liberation, we're talking about black people 
indigenous people, Latino people, working people of all colors. Yes, poor people of all colors, but I begin on the chocolate side of town and the critique of the American empire and the vicious forms of imperial policies, be it in Africa, Haiti, be it in Latin America, or be it manifest in a barbaric genocide that we don't have a language for. So I'm, I'm very blessed to be here. And I don't know what I could add to Dr. West other than um, I think something that was lifted earlier, that this is not our first time working together. We've been working together really for years, right? When we think about, we just um, passed the the anniversary of, or one of the anniversaries of the um, commitment to free Rochelle McGee and Rochelle McGee, you know, was the longest serving political prisoner in U.S. history. And um, Brother Cameron, you and I were deeply involved in that struggle and um, we marked one year since his um, transition recently. And, you know, we think about that. We think about the work that we've done around the world really to confront not only global white supremacy, but also the way in which capitalism ra ravages our world. Um, and we've been doing that together for years. And so it makes sense when we talk about an electoral strategy as part of not the whole thing, but part of freedom struggle, it makes sense for us to collaborate now. I know that Dr. West and I were both heartbroken, especially not having ballot access in places like Mississippi, um, when that's the place our campaign was launched. And it's the home of people like Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer. And to not have ballot access was heartbreaking for us until we realized that there are also people like Claudia and Karina who share our vision and commitment to black freedom struggle. And to, you know, when we think about the struggle in Mississippi, um, the struggles of working class people like the black washerwomen who were the first to really form what in all intents and purposes is a labor union, right? Um, that we have a Claudia and Karina who do have ballot access there. And it makes sense for the, us to say, look, it might not be us that you're voting for, but we share these principles. We are not in this out of ambition or ego. We are out in this out of vision and out of a longer term commitment to the freedom of our people. So we're very, very grateful and um, encouraged by this collaboration. Thank you so much. Incredibly powerful, Dr. West, Dr. Abdullah. And next up, I want to introduce Claudia de la Cruz, who's the presidential candidate for the Party for Socialism and Liberation, a political organization that fights for socialist transformation and reorganization of society, a system where working and poor people hold political and economic power and use it to meet the needs of all people and to preserve the planet. Please welcome Claudia de la Cruz. Thank you so much, Cameron. I'm just delighted. I'm very inspired and excited about this collaboration. We've marched together. We've been in panels together. We've protested in many different fronts together. And so it makes sense for us to continue to build that principled unity. And especially in a moment in which we understand that we're going to need all the forces, all the creativity, and all the intelligence of our people and our organizations to be able to advance our struggles. Whoever the tenant of the White House becomes November 5th, we are going to have to do it stronger and we're going to have to do it together. And I think this is just an expression of, of what we foresee and what we're willing and committed to doing um, in the near future to continue to do um, after November 5th. I also believe that it's, you know, it's incredible in a moment in which we are told that unity is basically impossible. Um, and there are so many people who are calling for unity in many different ways to have two campaigns that are have differences, be in conversation with each other and showing what collaboration could look like despite the many obstacles that this very undemocratic system places for such type of collaborations. And so I'm just thrilled at the potential of deepening that, expanding that, and starting to visualize what it would mean in the electoral front. Because I think in people's movements, we have that experience. We come from that experience and there's enough trust to be in conversation with each other. And so what would that mean for us in the near future, talking about what an actual 
third party of working class people would look like in this country. Um, and so I'm just very excited to be in conversation. I'm very excited to continue to struggle with you both and other comrades and friends from the Justice for All party. We are very, very much aligned despite the very significant differences. We are an explicitly socialist campaign, um, but we are here for justice and we are here for the total liberation of our class and our people. Um, we center the lives and the, the value of the historically marginalized of black, indigenous, working class people, immigrants, as, as those folks who hold the key to build the, the force to be reckoned with in society. And so nothing but excitement and inspiration from, from this conversation, from our continued commitment to build an independent movement of working class people in this country that has significant impact in the global community. So thank you so much for, for opening up this space. Thank you so much, Claudia. You know, very excited for the rest of this discussion. And with that, you know, I want to move into the messages that we're all being inundated with. Uh, this will be a question for actually all of you. You know, we hear a lot about Donald Trump, J.D. Vance on one side calling Kamala Harris a far left communist, something that couldn't be further from the truth, right? And on the other hand, we're hearing Trump and his supporters are the biggest threat to democracy that this country has ever faced. And really, what everyone in this country is facing is a lack of democracy, you know, our rights being taken away. And both of us, both of these campaigns are running third party campaigns that are excluded from the debates, ejected from the ballots, silenced in the media, and are still forging ahead in this undemocratic system. So can each campaign speak to how this is an intervention to expand democracy, sorry, democracy in the United States? Mm -hmm. Should I jump in or? Would you all? Yeah. Oh, no, all right, no one. One is that I, 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 I think it's so important, though, that we acknowledge the use of the word movement, motion, momentum, uh, that we are moments in movement. So even though we're campaigns, we're not fetishizing the vote. We're moments in social motion. And what does that mean? That means that we're willing to tell the truth. I think the most significant overlap we have between both of our groups is that we're fundamentally committed to telling the truth and the condition of truth is to allow suffering to speak. And in telling that truth, we can talk about, yes, the raw fascism of gangster Trump. We can talk about the multicultural militarism of war criminal Harris. We can talk about the organized greed on Wall Street and Silicon Valley and the ways in which working people are, are crushed and yet their humanity is never completely uh, suffocated. They fight, they bounce back. And we can talk about, you know, the, uh, the U.S. foreign policy and all of the ways in which it is so inextricably bound to American hegemony, corporate power. And when it takes the form of genocide that we're seeing in Gaza, yes, we will view that as a minimal litmus test of any morality of any politician here or around the world. Uh, and, and, and that sense, it seems to me, uh, uh, we have so much in common in, 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 in telling the truth about the chronic systemic corruption of the corporate duopoly and the ways in which it does not allow the unleashing of everyday people's humanity, creativity, possibility, and potentiality. And again, beginning on the chocolate side of things and spilling over and embracing the world. Well, you know, one thing that, that I feel is, is important to say that we are intervening in this moment to be able to deconstruct the logic of capitalism, the logic that tells us that democracy is limited to a ballot box with candidates that were imposed on us, not that we necessarily chose based on our interests, our aspirations, or our needs as working class people. Um, and that's why it's so important to say that we enter as third parties, as independent parties, fighting capitalism, not each other. <laughs> and that's very important to say, um, in a context where people have been taught that the only way to build is opposing each other as a class instead of fighting against the ruling class, which is what we need to do. Um, it's very important for our people to understand the intervention of 
third parties as part of the struggle to build and expand democracy in a country in which democracy protects the dictatorship of billionaires. Uh, dollar democracy, we're seeking to intervene and break through in a so-called demo democracy that has a long history of preventing people from engaging and actively participating in the political life and in the decision-making process of this country, economically, politically, socially, um, those who hold power are the ones who determine how we must exist. And so we're intervening precisely because we understand that that is wrong and that is undemocratic. It is undemocratic to live in a system that continues to uphold voter suppression. Uh, through tactics like ID laws, purging of voter rolls. I don't know if folks heard, but over 700,000 people were purged from voter rolls in North Carolina this year alone. Gen gerrymandering is real, is significant. And so we're taught to believe that this is the greatest democracy in the world. And the limiting of the options for people through kicking off third parties and independent parties from ballots all across the country has to be understood within the context of a tortured democracy and a democracy that does not center the working people who are the majority of people in this country. I think it forces and it begs the question, whose democracy are we asking to protect? Who has failed to expand or protect the, the, the few rights that we have earned because we've earned them, they haven't been given to us? Who has, who has conceded to, to, to give away whatever rights we have earned to the far right? <laughs> um, who has prevented us from gaining real people power? I mean, these are all questions that I think third parties um, and independent parties like ours push people to, to ask themselves. And in that question, then we could come to the conclusion, and I hope we come to the conclusion, that we need an independent movement of working class people to build a political instrument that actually represents our needs, our desires, our aspirations, our dreams, our interests, because we cannot expect that the two-party system that is paid for by Wall Street, by corporations, by the military contractors, who seem to be more and more aligned with each other to protect our rights against those who sign their checks. And so this is our intervention in a moment where everybody's paying attention to the elections, where everybody's talking to a certain extent, ruling class politics, who will win, who is the viable option. We intervene precisely to expand people's ways of thinking beyond the logic of capitalism. And I think it's something that both campaigns are doing quite effectively. Thank you. Thank you so much to you know all of the speakers, just because it's important to speak about this tortured form of democracy, you know, undemocratic system that we do live in. And another major point deeply tied to this is that many people are thinking about how much this country currently spends on the war machine. Uh, $1 trillion is, you know, the estimate, it's no exaggeration that this country truly spends $1 trillion on war. And while there are some differences between the campaigns, all of us can think of better ways to spend the money and can speak to the reliance that the US capitalist economy has on war. So I would like to open up the floor for both campaigns to have some time to talk about this question of uh, war, the capitalist economy, and the struggle against those evils. So first, let's hear from the Claudia and Karina campaign. And I just want to mention too that Karina Garcia is not here today because she's recently given birth and is on mom duty. <laughs> We salute her. We salute her and her precious little one. I know that's right. I know that's right. So let's hear from Claudia today. I mean, I think, you know, folks are coming to the conclusion that imperialism affects us all. U.S. imperialism affects every working class community in this country as much as it affects people around the world who are living under the boot of U.S. imperialism. And there's a realization that unfortunately has caused the sacrifice of many families in Gaza. I think in the last year, people have come to understand the connection between the investment, the, the brutal and criminal investment of this country in war and its war machine against our siblings across the globe and how that harms our communities here and our communities across the seas. To spend $300 billion to invest $300 billion of tax dollar money to continue to fund a proxy war in Ukraine is criminal. To fund 
every year, $400 billion of taxpayer money of the United States for the continuation of a campaign of extermination against the Palestinian people that did not start a year ago, but started 76 years ago. So we're talking about over 600, I mean, over 300, sorry, over $300 billion in the course of 76 years. That is criminal. And it's criminal on both ends. And so to, th to think and speak about capitalism in its, in its domestic form is to speak about the fact that we don't have access to free health care, to quality health care, that we don't have access to free education from pre-K to grad school, that the majority of people who go to school, who are working class, will, will end their studies with at least $40,000 worth of debt at the minimum. It's to say that we don't have investments in infrastructure that could secure and save the lives of people in climate disasters that are accelerated by U.S. imperialism, like what we saw not too long ago in the South. So all the divestment from life-giving structures that take place in the United States, all of that wealth that we work to produce that is hoarded by a small group of people is utilized to bomb, to invade, to kill, to slaughter our siblings across the globe. And so we have a historic responsibility as people living in the belly of the beast, in the belly of empire, not only to be anti-capitalist, but also to be anti-imperialist to stand against the U.S. war machine. We've seen the demands coming from working class people all across this country for a ceasefire, from, for an arms, arms embargo against the colonial state of Israel. And what we've received from the ruling class that is now collaborating with Netanyahu is not complicit, it's collaborating in genocide is the expansion of war. And so we have a responsibility to continue to make it impossible for them to govern impossible for them to continue to keep on with business as usual we need to stand in solidarity with our brothers and sisters because the same enemies that are slaughtering them are killing us in this country are deepening poverty are not allowing us to live with dignity and so i think from the vote socialist campaign our understanding of our domestic issues are intrinsically connected to the foreign policy of this country. And it needs to be rethought and it needs to be reorganized and it needs to be reconstructed. And our understanding of it is that from a socialist perspective, to rebuild it means that the foreign policy would have will, would be created on the basis of solidarity, of respecting the sovereignty of other countries and collaboration. We have a lot to learn from the global South and its developments. Um, and so, yeah, to continue to invest in the war machine, to continue to invest in U.S. imperialism doesn't only mean death for people across the seas, it's, it's meant to be death for us to here at home. Thank you so much, Claudia. And I just want to open the floor as well to the West Abdullah campaign to go ahead and respond to this prompt. Well, I'll echo so much of what Sister Claudia said that you know, when we think about budgets, when we think about the spending on genocide, there is a moral question, right? There's a moral question, and all of us um, in, in both campaigns are parents. And um, it becomes very difficult for me sometimes to talk about the genocide in Palestine um, without becoming emotional. And I've learned to not um, apologize for my emotions and be grateful for my tears because it means that I still have humanity, right? I haven't been um, killed. Capitalism hasn't killed me yet. White supremacy, white supremacy hasn't killed me yet. It hasn't killed my soul. And so I'm grateful for my tears. There's a moral question that any parent and any human being should ask, right? How could it possibly be right to slaughter what's now estimated to be 100,000 people in just over a year in Palestine. We should all be sickened and weeping and outraged. That should fill us. And as Sister Claudia was uplifting, there's the moral question, and Dr. Julia Malvo often talks about 
budgets as moral and ethical documents, but she also says there's zero sum games. And I think that what Sister Claudia was uplifting is that when we spend trillions of dollars, and that's the Pentagon budget alone, uh, trillions of dollars on war that is immoral and sickening and an abomination, we're also committing genocide here at home, right? When we say that we are spending all of this money for Israel to kill Palestinians, that means that we're not housing our folks. We're not providing health care for our folks. We're saying that there's no money for education, right? That, but, but really, if we reprioritize, there's enough money, there's enough resources for all of that. We could have quality education, pre-K through PhD guaranteed for everyone. We could have health care for everyone. And I mean, um, address it as the healthcare justice issue that Dr. West and I understand it to be, where we say it's not just healthcare for all, but it's also undoing the system of medical apartheid, right? We could have housing for everybody. And I don't mean, I live in California and I know brother Cameron, you've seen what some of these so-called leaders are saying, putting people in um, tiny homes and parking lots, which are basically trailers with outhouses. No, we could have housing that um, one of our brothers, Pete White says, the question should be, would your mama live there, right? We could has, have housing that's fit for the inhabitants of human beings if we made different choices. So this is both a foreign policy, but also a domestic policy question. And I think at its heart, it's a moral and human and spiritual question. Where do we want our dollars to go? And if you talk to any human being, I think if you say, would you rather spend a dollar on war? Or would you rather spend a dollar on clean water? Would you rather spend a dollar on killing children in Palestine? Or would you rather spend a dollar educating children here at home? I think that pretty much everyone, working class people especially, are on the same page. Absolutely. You know, those are two eloquent statements. Really, it's, it's, it's powerful. I mean, it's, when Brother Martin used to say the bombs dropped in Vietnam land in ghettos and barrios and reservations in poor white communities within the United States, he was talking about that intimate relation between domestic policy and foreign policy, between imperial policies on the one hand and the predatory capitalist policies at home. And we begin to see the continuity. We begin to see militarism with cop cities. How many is it now, Sister Molina? They talk about in the states for cop cities. There's 86 of them. Eighty-six cop cities all around the country. Of course, the big fight um, began in Atlanta, but we know that Stop Cop Nation is now underway, which I think is the importance and you know part of our solidarity part of the work that we continue to do together is to also remember that as they move forward we also move forward and when the people come together and demonstrate solidarity and are invested in a shared vision we will yeah. defeat and then that vicious legacy of white supremacy and, still and operating machine everywhere else in the context of genocide in gaza because i think the whole world knows that if those precious Palestinian babies and men and women were Europeans or white or Israeli Jews, and I believe every human life has the same value. I'm, I'm a serious Christian about that. But everybody knows that if the, those crimes of genocide were perpetrated by Africans, by black people, by Arabs, by Muslims against Europeans, there'd be a qualitatively different response. So even given our zeroing in on predatory capitalist systems and zeroing in on the thoroughly exploitative imperial policies and subjugative policies, uh, that this element of white supremacy cannot be downplayed or overlooked. We have to have a holistic analysis. And of course, just on moral grounds, I think it also holds for our precious gay and lesbian brothers and sisters and our trans transgender precious folk too but 
it, we, we, we try to have a holistic analysis that links the need for social motion in between elections, not just every four years, in between elections. You're going to see us in the street. You're going to see us fighting. And we resurface in the electoral moment and we go right back on the streets. But we have to have a holistic analysis that connects the spiritual, the social, the personal, political, the economic, and the existential. And do it in such a way that we still have some fun and work together with style and a smile. Much, much appreciated, Dr. West, Dr. Abdullah. Really appreciate it. And this actually brings us to our final point, which I know is central to both campaigns, the question of power. You know, who has it? Who doesn't? How do we win it? And each of our campaigns have robust grassroots efforts to get on the ballot and have also faced vicious attacks from super PACs and Democrats and their lawyers trying to kick us off the ballot in numerous states. So as all eyes are on the election, what can we say to our supporters about what it takes to really win power in this country? Let's go ahead and start with uh, Dr. West and Dr. Abdullah. Well, for me, I always historicize, contextualize, and pluralize. And therefore, anytime you talk about power, you're talking about powers. Economic power, you're talking about exploitative capitalist system. Political powers, you're talking about politicians who are extensions of big money locked in the form of legalized bribery and politicized larceny and normalized corruption. But there are also spiritual powers. There are moral powers. There are civic powers powers. And each one of those spheres are ones in which we can generate conceptions of ourselves based on a self-respect and a self-regard, and most importantly, a courage and integrity and honesty that then takes the form of organizing. And by organizing, we bring tremendous powers to bear against the ruling class powers in the economic and political and imperial spheres. And, and in that way, we head toward the kind of revolutionary transformation that is required if those slides don't call everyday people are ever gonna live lives of decency and dignity here, in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, in the Caribbean, in Harlem where I live, or on the south side of Chicago or Los Angeles, where I am right now. And I'll, if, if it's OK, I'll just add um, that I think that that we're closing the conversation with where we started, that our work together didn't begin with this campaign, that we understand, both campaigns understand, that no oppressed people have won their freedom simply by voting for it right, that this is our electoral strategy is one piece. It's one tool in a toolbox. And we're going to use that tool as best we can. And we have many, many other tools. And we're going to continue to organize. The power that we have is a power that we have to exercise on November 5th. But the much larger power is the power that we continue to exercise after November, November 5th, November 6th and beyond. We say that we vote and we organize in Black Lives Matter Grassroots, which is my organizational home. We say we vote and we organize. And so we're grateful, grateful, grateful to be voting and organizing um, along with Dr. West. You know, this has been a tremendous moment um, within a movement. And we continue to organize with PSL and Vote Socialist and Claudia and Karina when we talked about ending the genocide, genocides that are, are rampant around the world, when we talk about ending global capitalism that wreaks havoc on this planet, when we talk about stopping cop cities, when we talk about what working class people want, need, and deserve and can have, we can have it when we struggle forward together. And so I think the power comes um, in the show of solidarity, but more importantly, in the solidarity that we'll continue to exercise as we do work and, and invest in the struggle until we get free. Thank you so much, Dr. West, Dr. Abdullah, and Claudia, your thoughts. Well, I, I often think about Amilcar Cabral's 
quote that says, tell no lies and claim no easy victories. I think we should keep that in mind. And as both Dr. West and Dr. Abdullah mentioned, our, our strategy is larger than an election cycle. And it's a, elections are a tactic. Elections are a way of intervening in a specific moment. But what we are attempting to build is an independent movement of working class people that have the confidence to, to fight back, to fight back in every space and at every moment against the capitalist system that strives to kill them, um, to kill us and to kill the planet. And when we launched this campaign, when we conceptualized this campaign, we conceptualized it precisely as an intervention that could engage in mass education, that could engage in reactivating or activating people who are new to movement in a moment where there is a heightened level of mobilizations, understanding that in the patterns of histories, there is ebbs and flows in movements and that ultimately people need to join political organizations. People need to build organizations that allow them to strengthen themselves in the creation of a movement that allows them to become contributors, active participant in the development of the power that belongs to the people. Because yes, capitalism has economic and political power. But let's just think about the 160 million people who are living in or near poverty in this country. And what could happen if that great majority gains class consciousness? What could happen if that great majority understands that the ruling class has not their interests at, at heart? And so that is the majority of people that we have the task of activating, not during the election cycle, but every damn day of the year. And so building organization also allows us to advance our struggles around immigration rights, to advance our struggles around police brutality and against mass incarceration, to advance our struggles for every small and large civil and human right that we so much need and deserve. And I think it's important to say that because we have a sleeping giant in this country, and that is the working class. Folks that have understood that the ruling class and its two-party system does not work for them, but there's an imp imposition of hopelessness. There's an imposition of isolation. And so I think it's important for us to intervene in the everyday lives of our people, giving that hope, giving that orientation, and giving that space for them to participate and become part of an organized struggle, which is ultimately the biggest threat of the capitalist system of US imperialism and white supremacy. When people have the ability to organize themselves and fight back, they don't know what to do with themselves. And that is exactly what they are trying to prevent us from doing. That is why the Democratic Party is spending so much money in marketing, trying to convince people that they are the ones that we should follow. But our people are people of memory and our people are people of backbone. And so we need to be able to organize the discontent, to organize the hopelessness, to organize in many ways what people have understood to be real, that this system does not work for them. But where do we go from here? And where we go from here is building a force to be reckoned with. But we have to do that every day of the year, 365 days. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And I just want to extend one big thank you to all three of you, Claudia de la Cruz, Dr. Cornell West, and Dr. Melina Abdullah for this enriching conversation and all your work. And this conversation is just another addition to our trajectory of working together as we forge ahead into this next phase of struggle for justice in the United States and around the world. And to repeat the point from earlier, the Claudia Karina campaign is calling on its supporters to vote for West and Abdullah in Alaska. And in turn, West and Abdullah are calling on their supporters to vote for Claudia and Karina in Florida, Hawaii, New Mexico, Mississippi, and Tennessee. So I want to invite any of you who are watching to stay connected with our campaigns. You can go to CornellWest2024.com and VoteSocialist2024.com to learn more about these campaigns and follow them on social media. So we'll see you at the polls and in the struggle for justice.